Hello and welcome to Barry Interesting. I'm Barry Acock, your host. This is our final episode of this season and it is a great show. Tonight, our feature interview is with Dr. Carlos Vargas, the president of Southeast Missouri State University. I'd like to welcome Dr. Carlos Vargas, president of Southeast Missouri State University to Barry Interesting today. Dr. Vargas, Thank you for coming today. Thank you. It's a pleasure having you. Thank you. It's a pleasure uh, to be here. We've met before, but it was in a large group, so I'm sure you don't remember it, but it's an honor to have you here today to talk about your life and SEMO. Thank you. I appreciate that very much. There's nobody that knows any more about your life than you, right? Uh, maybe my sisters. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dr. Vargas, where did you grow up? Uh, I grew up in different places in Mexico, in the country of Mexico. I was born in Mexico City. Uh, but my father worked in a company that uh, actually built uh, hydroelectric power plants. And so we moved uh, uh, around the country uh, for a few years uh, before we settled in Mexico City again. So your dad was quite an innovator then, it sounds like. Right. Well, he was the accountant for the company. Uh, and uh, so he would go around and he would be the one that would give the, the checks to people who worked there. So he was very popular. So did you go to high school in Mexico City? I did, yes. How uh, big a high school was that? I had the public high school. Uh, it was a relatively small high school at the time, uh, a couple of thousand students, uh, very new. Uh, I, actually, my class inaugurated the building. Uh, very exciting and uh, in Mexico City, yes. Uh, part of the university, part of the National University. In the National University, that you, after you graduated from high school, you attended the National University in Mexico City? Yes, that's correct. And how many students were at that university at the time and today? Well, at the time there were about 200,000. Wow. Uh, right now we have uh, 250,000 uh, roughly, um, with about 100,000 in uh, high schools that are part of the university system. Mm -hmm. That would be the largest university in the United States if it was here, correct? Probably, yes. <laughs> so even our big schools like Ohio State, Michigan, I think they're 30 to 40,000 or something like that. I may be wrong about that, but yes. So how do you differentiate yourself as talented as you were in such a large university? Well, it's interesting. Um, one of the things that uh, happens in Mexico and many other countries, Latin American countries, is we don't have at the university level the general education curriculum that you have here. Uh, the, all the general education curriculum that you take, you take during high school. When you go to the university, you actually are uh, focusing on your major. So when I went to, to uh, the university, to the Faculty of Sciences, that's the name of the school, the Faculty of Sciences, um, all I took was uh, classes in physics, mathematics, maybe a little bit of chemistry uh, for the four years. So you come out of uh, with a college degree uh, really very well prepared uh, in your major, but you do have a, what I would call is like deficiency in terms of the general education curriculum. You don't have much of opportunity to, to uh, take classes in philosophy, history, um, other languages, literature, and so on. So you're becoming an expert in your field the minute you start your bachelor's degree in Mexico City. That's right. In Mexico. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So you start focusing like a laser beam on your specialty area immediately. They immediately, right. So you graduated from the National University. Did you take a job? Your degrees, your degrees in physics, correct? A bachelor's degree in physics, yes. So did you, did, you, did you go out to the workforce or did you look for a master's degree? Yes, no, I actually, uh, right before, <clears throat> excuse me, right before I finished, uh, I applied for a scholarship uh, to the federal government in Mexico uh, so I could continue my doctoral studies. Um, and I wanted to leave the country. I wanted to come to the U.S. Uh, at one point, I, I thought about possibly going to Germany, but uh, for a variety of reasons, I uh, ended up actually applying to a university here in the U.S., uh, University of Michigan. I got the scholarship from the government. It's a scholarship that if you get, uh, all they have, uh, uh, they say, well, show us that you have admission to a university uh, and then you have the money. So I applied to the University of Michigan. I was accepted there. So uh, all my uh, doctoral studies were uh, paid for by the Mexican government, essentially. 
So when you graduated from University of Michigan, uh, what was your first job out of college? My first job is going back to Mexico to the National University to work there as a faculty member. Was that part of your scholarship to go back? Yes, the scholarship actually, uh, if I didn't go back and work in a public institution, I was expected to pay the money back. So it was a loan that as long as you worked in a public institution, it was condoned. So uh, I went back and uh, my first job was actually at the Institute of Geophysics at, uh, at uh, the National University. I was there for a couple of years and then I moved over to the Institute of Physics. Uh, and that's where I continued uh, doing my research. And you told me before we come on camera that when you go back to the, the National University, you don't do research and teaching. You either go one way or the other. And they gave you the career path where you maybe selected it for research. Although you wanted to teach, right? Right, yes. You kind of wiggled your way in there to be a teacher at the end, right? At the end, yes. I really wanted to teach and so uh, I, I was able to uh, work my way into uh, the committee that assigns courses to the faculty and uh, I said okay guys I want to uh, teach a class here so because uh, as I mentioned to you also uh, at the National University you have the place where you teach the programs where students study the career, their majors is called the faculty uh, faculty of sciences and then there's the Institute of Physics which is where faculty who are involved in research actually uh, reside and uh, when you apply for a job at the university, you choose whether you are interested in following the teaching track or the research track. I follow the research track. And, and uh, so then <clears throat> in order for me to teach, I had to uh, get my way in, in there. So. so after you went back to the National University in Mexico City, you fulfilled your commitment and you, you woke up one day and said, I need to make more money for my family, so I need to get a job in the United States at a university, correct? Yes, it was uh, a little bit more um, of a challenge for me because actually uh, we were there in Mexico City. I was the faculty member, but then we had a situation where my daughter, uh, my oldest daughter, actually um, developed signs of uh, uh, sort of uh, what they call petit mal, which is epilepsy. Um, which I detected uh, and uh, we went to the doctor and she needed to have some studies done and all that and, and we didn't really have much money, uh, extra money to pay for some of those studies. If you go to the uh, public uh, health system, it takes a long time before you get uh, uh, to see a doctor. Uh, so that sort of made me think that uh, uh, I really uh, was not in a very good place in order to, for me to provide my family with, with what they needed. So we decided to explore coming to the U.S. and see if, if things were a bit more uh, uh, comfortable for us living here. And, and that's what we did. We, we returned to the U.S. And when you returned to the U.S., what was, what was your career path at that time? What job did you take? Um, when I came back, um, my wife's mother lived in Ohio. And so she offered uh, us the, her home to uh, live in for the time being until I found a job and, and my wife could find a job too. Uh, we had three children at the time, uh, uh, a boy and two girls. Uh, and, uh, and so we were very close to a university, Kent State University in Ohio. And uh, so I decided to go and, and visit the university. And I was fortunate enough that I was able to connect uh, with uh, individuals there who were interested in me. And I became a faculty member at Kent State. And it became a long-term career for me uh, after that. And how long were you at Kent State? Um, uh, 18 years, uh, actually. Mm -hmm. So you liked it there. It was a good, you called it home for a long time. Yes, yes. So did you teach there or do research? I did both. <clears throat> I did both. Um, I, I certainly was not really very excited about doing full-time teaching. I really wanted to do some research because that's what I did in Mexico, uh, as I mentioned before. And so um, I um, developed this connection with uh, a NASA center in Cleveland, uh, Ohio. And so um, I got a grant from them to get some money so I could 
um, uh, sort of essentially buy myself out of teaching courses. So throughout my 18 years at Kent State, I really basically taught one course per semester. Uh, and all the other courses uh, I bought out uh, with a grant from, from NASA. So I was very active uh, working and doing research with the NASA Center in Cleveland. So after Kent State, what, what was your next career move? Well, after Kent State, um, I actually, um, what happened is while I was at Kent State, I became aware of a program. Um, uh, it's a leadership program in higher education that uh, the American Council on Education has. Um, and uh, it gave me an opportunity to spend a year in a different institution in the U.S. Uh, learning about uh, administration. And so for a variety of reasons, and uh, I was able to get the opportunity to go to uh, University of Massachusetts in Amherst uh, to spend that year there, uh, uh, essentially learning from the chancellor of the university, who happened to be also a physicist. Uh, but I learned about uh, administration, and I became very interested in it. So when I went back to Kent State after that year, uh, I spent about three or four more years there, but then I decided that I really wanted to get into the administrative track or so per se. I really was interested in the administrative track that was associated to research um, in, at, at Kent State, promoting research throughout the university. Uh, but then as, as you move forward, then things start happening and you start uh, moving forward, uh, learning more, uh, given opportunities. And at one point, uh, you start developing your own view of how an institution could or should work. Um, and then uh, you start realizing, which is what happened to me, that uh, the ideas that I had, the only way that I really was going to be able to put them in practice is if I was the president. Mm -hmm. And so that's what then ultimately made me feel I, I really want to become a president. So Dr. Vargas, did you want this job really bad when you found out that you got it? Were you like giving high fives to your wife in the house? I did. As a matter of fact, uh, I, uh, when we received the call, um, I answered the phone and uh, uh, Mr. Privet was the, uh, Doyle Privet was the president of the Board of Regents. He's the one that called me. Uh, and uh, started talking to me <clears throat> and uh, started describing the fact that uh, uh, as an introduction here, you know, they had a very large pool and very uh, strong pool of candidates and all that. So my wife was looking at me from the, the few feet away. And when he said that he was talking to me like that, I went like, it's, it's a, it, that's the introduction to Bad say. News. It's a strong pool, so unfortunately, we, so, uh, so he at one point he said, so we would like to uh, offer you the position. <laughs> and I remember that I said, I accept. <laughs> <laughs> I, I yelled and all that. My wife was like, what, what, what happened? I've uh, repeated that story uh, in front of Mr. Privet and he smiles about it. I, I was really, really happy uh, when we received that phone call and, and he offered me the position. But something very special happened in your life after you moved to Cape Girada. You became a U.S. citizen on July the 4th of 2016, so it was almost a year after you arrived in Cape Girada. Yes. So tell us about that experience and how, how that must have made you feel. Yeah, that, that's a really interesting story because uh, uh, when I first came to this country uh, as, a, uh, as a resident alien, as a uh, permanent resident, um, I I used the fact that I was married to a U.S. citizen, my wife, to expedite the process. It's a lot easier if you are married uh, for you to get the permanent residency. It was, for sure. <laughs> um, and that particular trip that I made when I first showed my uh, permanent residency, I actually had gone to uh, uh, spend time in Colombia uh, doing some research with a colleague. and. In Medellin, which of course, uh, if you look back in time, that was one of the uh, main locations for drugs in, in, in Colombia at the time, and there was a lot of violence and all that. And, and so uh, uh, when I was taking the flight from Medellin to the US, uh, they stopped the flight because they found drugs in the 
in the plane. So they stopped it uh, overnight. So we ended up leaving at five in the morning or so. So I got to the U.S. and then that's my, end, my first time coming into the country as a permanent residence from Mexico from, through Colombia. So I thought, gosh, this is going to be hard. <laughs> Well, anyway, so fortunately everything went, went okay. And then, and that was 85. And then um, I, I was here for a period of time and after a period of time I decided I, I really would like to get my, my citizenship. And at the time you needed to be at least five years for, as a permanent residence before you could apply for residency, for a, a citizenship. So anyway, time went by, went by. I started the process a few times and for whatever reason I never finished it. Either bureaucracy uh, didn't connect, didn't get answers. The point is when I got here I had gone through a few iterations of uh, trying to get my citizenship. And I, so I actually contacted one of these private companies that offered to help you to get your citizenship. So I Remember, they charged me about 200 and some dollars, and so I submitted, I paid the money and all that, and it still it wasn't going, it was not as smooth as I happened to meet uh, George Steve Limbaugh uh, here when I was here, and, and he, he said, um, it's, it's very easy to do that, and I said, well, I've tried, but I, I he said, well, I can help you with that, so he said, you don't even need anybody to do it. So he sent me the link to the office, and the government office, where you, I could just fill out my application. So I did that, and then he essentially sort of worked through, with me through the process, and it became so simple um, to the point where actually uh, I got my interview in St. Louis, and I went to the interview, they did my exam, and, and I, and all of a sudden, um, the process was over, so I couldn't believe it. And I, I owe him so much. He's just such a wonderful individual. And uh, so um, then, of course, it was the ceremony, for naturalization ceremony. And uh, it turns out that uh, they have some in Cape, and he presided over the ceremony. And they had one on the 4th of July of 2016. So I actually was part of that cohort. Uh, and my son actually came uh, for that. My son uh, joined the Marines. Uh, and uh, uh, at the time, I think he was already a captain, I believe, uh, in the Marines and uh, a couple of tours of duty that he did in, in Afghanistan and Iraq. And <clears throat> so he was very proud. I was very proud. So it was a really, the, the, it's, it's a happy ending story. Uh, and, and uh, I, I'm, I'm so pleased and so, so happy that I was able to do that. And what better day to celebrate it than the 4th of July, right? Absolutely, absolutely. I thought that's, that's the greatest thing, so. You've immersed yourself in the culture of Southeast Missouri State University. I've seen you at football games. You're more excited than the typical fan when Southeast Missouri State <laughs> football team scores a touchdown. If somebody gets a dunk at the basketball game, you're more excited than the, the regular fan there. So. You really immersed yourself into the culture there at Southeast Missouri State. You become a part of the thread there at Southeast Missouri State. So I think you've had a successful run for five years now. So tell us about how that experience has been for you personally. It, it's uh, allowed me to um, do something that I never thought I would be able to do, which is to be a president of an institution. I still, these days, I think about it and I, I walk around campus and I say, wow. I'm responsible. I mean, it's, 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 I need to be very careful here. So I remind myself all the time about how important it is that, that I uh, don't take this for granted. Uh, and uh, it's allowed me to uh, put in practice my beliefs that we need to be totally committed to the success of our students, that that's the bottom line. Uh, and, uh, and, and so I'm very focused on that. I see every student, I, I, I see myself in every student. And I was a first generation student. My family never, nobody went to college or anything. I was the first one to do it. Um, and we were very, uh, we were very poor. I mean, we never owned a home or anything like that. We were, so, we were renting uh, from place to place. 
So you, you have in me somebody who is really very average. Uh, and, uh, and so um, but when I think about the fact that I've been lucky enough to uh, fulfill certain dreams, certain goals, dreams that I didn't even know I had, um, I feel like every student has that potential. I know that. And so um, I get very sometimes uh, um, frustrated because I just want to be able to reach them and make them realize that they have the potential uh, to do it. It's just staying the course. It's just doing your work. You, you, you just cannot assume that things are going to happen automatically. You have to do the work. So I talk to the students about uh, how it is important that they see their time in college as a partnership. Uh, the university is trying to give you uh, the resources you need to be successful, but you need to be willing to take them and to do what it takes to do it. You can't just sit back and say, okay, graduate me, uh, get me a job. You have to do that. And, and sometimes it's hard because some students have difficult lives when they're children. And so you have to work against that sometimes. Dr. Vargas, we're out of time. I could talk to you all night, but as you know, there's many, many rich traditions at Southeast Missouri State University. Basketball, football, gymnastics, softball, that's the sports. But we also, at Southeast Missouri State, uh, train world-class teachers. Teachers are a big thing at Southeast Missouri State. So I wanna thank you for ensuring that our future persists with that. And with you at the helm, we have a, a bright future ahead. Thank you very much. Very, I really coming. appreciate it. Thank you. Good to see you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. And now we have a preview of our second documentary, which will be coming out on Sunday evening right here on Acorp Media. It's about Las Brisas restaurants. We had a chance to sit down with Gustavo Marquez, owner of Las Brisas. I want to welcome my good friend, Gustavo Marquez, to the show. Thank you. The documentary, The History of Las Brisas, will be launching Sunday. We're really excited about that. It's kind of the history of your life, the history of your business. It's the history of the American dream. We're going to bring it to you this Sunday. Gustavo, what was it like, the journey making this documentary? Has it been fun? Has it been boring? Have you learned anything about yourself? Hey, it's, it's been a good time, been fun. I never dream of uh, somebody, someone to make, make a documentary for me, but hey, uh, I'm excited about how they're going to turn out. It says a lot about your business and about your family. You'll become a part of many communities. You own many stores now, not just the one in Malden, but your family has how many stores now? Uh, there are 11 stores right now with the, all the family, basically all the Booth Hill and part of Arkansas too. And your goal is to be the number one Mexicano restaurant in the state of Missouri, correct? That's the goal. That's the goal, that's the goal. Well, if anybody will get there, you will, because hard work pays off, and my friend, you've done it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. It's, uh, we, we, we here, we're here to work for the people and, and, and to serve the people. Uh, and I'm glad that the, the, the people welcome us and the Bull Hill and, and the surrounding areas. Well, Gustavo, tell us a little bit about your journey here for 16 years. I mean, you started with one store, probably with no credit, didn't know anybody. so. Tell us about this true story of the American dream. Yes. Uh, nah, not only no credit, no English too. Uh, it's been a journey. Uh, the, the good thing about this is uh, people welcome us with uh, uh, open arms. And, 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 and they've been also teaching us how to do us work and, and make sure we serve them right. Uh, it's, uh, we, we call him uh, Sueño Americano in Spanish, uh, but it's, uh, it's been a bless. It's been a bless to, to know, to become a part of, uh, of the community and, and, and make a lot of friends, lots of friends, like you, like, you know, so many, so many, so many people. Uh, I, be, I know a lot of people, I probably don't know names, but man, if you show me a face, I tell who, who they are and, and where they live, pretty much. And where they like to eat, of course. 
That's a really good point. You become a part of the community. When somebody has a crisis like Gideon had the tornado, you were there feeding everybody in the, in the city. So yes, you, you've been like the thread of every community around here. I want to thank you for doing that. Thank you. You're a good friend to my family, so I hope we've been a good friend to yours. And yes, you are. We've watched each other's kids grow up. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of been a journey for both of us, kind of reminiscing over the last 16 years. And we've laughed, we've cried, we shared meals together. Mm -hmm. And it's just been a, a great ride for you. It's been a good one. It's been a good one. Uh, I, you know, the, with the Gideon, with Gideon deal and, and that and that storm come through, you know, uh, it, it was a, a deal. I, I, I come through there and I see so many familiar faces to me. You can go through there and not stop and help. You know, it's just, uh, if you do that, I mean, basically you don't have no heart to, to, to you know, to do anything. Uh, it, it was devastated. <laughs> you know, how many houses broke down and uh, how many friends I see. And, and I think, Gustavo, that's been the key to your success. You and your family have a heart for people. Without people, you, have, you don't have a business, yes, right? Yes, sir. Uh, I mean, the, the, you know, uh, I, I've, been, I've been learning in these 16 years. <clears throat> I've been uh, become more mature. In the beginning, you know, I was young. I was only 22 years old when we opened here. Now I'm 38, and, uh, and when I'm young, you know, we make a lot of mistakes. We don't, you know, but people been uh, hanging in there with me, you know, and 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 and, and I think they knew I was gonna become a little better, and, and I, you know, and, and I don't know if I become the person they want me to be, but uh, at least I try to 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 take care uh, much as I can and when I can, you know help everybody. Did you think 16 years ago you'd be sitting in Malden, Missouri uh, talking about a documentary about your life, your family, and your business? To be honest, no. No. Uh, it's uh, in 16 years, uh, man, life take you to, to places you're never going to know. Uh, it, it's uh, I only been working hard, try to be myself, try to, you know, try to do the right thing, what my dad say, do the right thing. And, and, and do the right thing now is only not about serving other people, is do the right thing, that, like the world say, you know. And uh, these 16 years has been uh, good to my family, uh, not only to to my family, like my wife and my children, to my <clears throat> to my mom and, and my other uh, 12 brothers. Uh, we are 12 in the family, uh, seven sisters and five brothers. Of course, I'm the best looking. Uh, <laughs> of course. <laughs> and, you know, we basically start with uh, nothing, nothing. And, and, and I learned how to work in restaurant business. I tell my dad, come over and 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 and, and work with me and to put the restaurant and somehow he believed me so here we are 16 years later congratulations thank it's you. been a great 16 year ride thank you thank you we're really excited about bringing the documentary of los brisas to you and he started off with a dream 16 years ago right here in malden missouri and today he's sitting in the king's chair on top of the world very blessed thank you look forward to bringing it to you sunday Well, that's it for tonight's show and for season two of Very Interesting. I hope you have enjoyed the interviews and segments we have presented for you. We will be back in February with more stories to tell. Thank you.